everybody. Welcome to T.L.'s Roadhouse. We have our special guest with us today, my old friend, Miss Terry Clark. Is Hi. In the house. Hi. Hi. How are you doing, friend? I'm good. It's, it's good to see you. It's so I've great been to waiting see for you. two days to see you. I know. Don't okay. get. Don't even with that. I. <laughs> so, man, I've just been laying and waiting, laying uh, and waiting. Do I need one of those chairs for that? <laughs> for twenty four hours. I don't know. I was talking to uh, to St- Stevie, our our social media girl that we share. Um, earlier, Hello, Stevie. She's, she's, hi, Stevie. She seems to think that maybe I wrote down the time in West Coast time I was out there or something. And My calendar will do that if wrote I it, it, typed it down. If I put, typed like, uh, we were supposed to meet at one yesterday. So if you're on West Coast time and you type it in on Google Cal, yeah. it will put it in three. Well, and it was three o'clock in my was, calendar. Yeah. This goes to show I need to read the details from management when they give me a schedule. I need to actually not just look at my own calendar ever again. I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah, it's so okay. I finally made it. But it worked out great. I had yeah. a cancellation, so I had today free. So, oh, good. and I've been excited about visiting. I've with you. been excited to see you. Yes. It's like it's the more, the more new people that come along in country music, the more I appreciate my friends when I see them again. It's like we we grew up together in this. And, and back so in the cool. day, we all toured so much together. Now, yeah. it's, uh, I, I, are you uh, working on a '90s tour package or something for next year? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next year, but yeah. I, I'm working really hard this year. I went out with Reba last year and did a bunch of shows with awesome. her. Um, that we've got some things in the hopper. You know, I've, I'm kind of, I'm trying to kind of uh, work smarter, not harder these days, because you know, for years, we stayed out. All the time on the road, constantly touring, oh, yeah. constantly touring. And, um, you know, I, I've i just tried to strike more of a balance as I get older and, and you know, and, and hopefully um, not just ever resent my job because I'm doing too much of one thing and not enough of the other. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, you probably have experienced the same thing. I said after COVID I wouldn't. It, the hardest thing for me was, you know, when everything shut down uh, that first week of March in 2020, Mm -hmm. it was me and Justin Moore and Lanny Wilson was opening for us with an acoustic guitar by herself. And then that first week of March rolled around. We had just done our last show. I think it was Kansas City and got back home and the plug got pulled on Mm -hmm. everything. I had the hardest time decompressing Mm -hmm. from getting off the treadmill. And I swore after I kind of calmed down after the first several months that I was not going to get back on that treadmill. And then when things fired back up, it's like money went up and our ticket sales went up. And every time you turn it down, turn it down three times, they just keep raising the money. It's like at some point you wake up and you wind up doing more dates than you were doing before. At least that's the way it's been for me. Yeah, yeah. I, and and it's it seemed to have ramped back up pretty quick when it did. But I, I mean, did you have a hard time just staying home? I mean, like I, the first three months, I thought it was only going to be a couple of three months. And then it, when it looked like it was going to be a hell of a lot longer than that, I was just like, well, I just need to embrace being home and being off and not doing this for a while. I was that way. So it sh- they pulled the plug on everything in March. And, and what always fascinated me about it, you know, you always feel like entertainment's insulated. You know, people are going to go out. They might not buy the T-shirt uh, and the ball cap, but they'll pay the money to come out and maybe get a beer or whatever. They still, they've, we've never been shut down like that. Mm. Theaters shut down, sporting events shut down, music events shut down. Everything just got locked up. And I kept thinking this is just going to be a couple of months. And then yeah. April rolled by and May rolled by. And I remember I, ha- I had nine shows on the books for July. And I'm like, okay, if we can just get to July, we've taken all this time off, we'll get back to work. As we rolled into July, everything got pulled. But I had one private show on the 4th of July for a friend of mine, and that was the only show we had. I knew after that that we were going to be dead in water for yeah. the rest of the year. And I had a hard time just calming down, you know, because people don't realize some, getting in front of that crowd is, is like an addiction in a lot of ways. You, mm-hmm. Do you feel that way too? I do, yeah. I It's... Not being able to bring joy to people at a time when they needed it the most yeah. was the hardest thing for me. And, and music is is the, the universal healing uh, language, and and it brings people together. And it, it's nostalgic, and it's all, our, our music at this point is very nostalgic 
for people. And, and there's a comfortableness to it, and yeah. I think that's one of the things that has, has elevated it back up to extreme popularity again, is that there's so many things that are off balance in our country right yep. now. And I think the familiarity and the warmth, because the 90s was great songwriting, great yeah. tracks. Producers were great. Every artist, we all had our own personality. Everybody sounded different. And nobody was overlapping. Now it just seems like there's a lot of sameness. And I, I, yeah. I've pondered on this a lot, and, and I've kind of narrowed it down to a couple of things. It's almost like everything is pro-tooled so hard that everybody's starting to sound the same. I think the I think the, the, the tuning... Uh, programs and the compression the same types of of equipment they're using on vocals does tend to make everybody sound the same and, and it also holds singers to a standard that they have to be perfect all the time mm. like it freaks me out if i hear myself go flat or sharp on a note or something but usually flat for me i'm like oh my god but that's being a human being that's being a singer that isn't being tuned up on, and some of them carry them out on the road too. But I, you know? also too that you could tune those things so precise and so I call it hard tuning where everything is right up to oh, the line. Yeah, yeah. That as a vocalist, that's a stylistic kind of singer. Mm -hmm. You can't sing that way. No. I mean, if you tune it really hard and don't slide up on you notes, there's yeah, certain ways you can't that slide into I a note. Can't do that. You can't <laughs> no. do that when it's tuned hard, and it, it, it's very frustrating. And that I think that's what's creating a lot of the sameness. Now, now, that's not to say that there's a lot of these artists that are really, really talented. Oh, Cody Johnson sure. and Randy yes. Hauser. Yeah. There's some true oh, God. Yeah. great singers Randy's out there. Ridiculous. That, that Randy's a ridiculous yeah. artist. I mean, he's just so good. There's so much good talent out there. It'd be nice to see everything kind of soften up a little bit I as agree. far as production wise. I, I agree, and and I think that's part of the popularity of our era the 90s era yeah. everybody had such an individual unique quality to their voice and everybody just let everyone be themselves you know yeah. musically and um i think some of the production kind of bled over a little bit on the records of the 90s you know because we all use the same musicians <laughs> we were all that using brent mason yeah. and we were all using michael rhodes and glenn Morf and all those yeah. guys that but they also tailored the track to the artist and listened to the artist and 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 made the track you know match what the song was saying so but I, I I do miss that individuality and I've said that a lot in interviews that I've done you know that I miss that you knew who it was the second that person opened their mouth and oh, now you know it I do, it it takes me a minute to figure out whether it's this guy or that guy or that girl because there there is there's a sameness to it for sure we we both have stumbled into working in radio and yeah. i don't know really how that happened i've been doing my radio show for about 10 years plus and you've been doing yours for how long you've been 10 doing years it. yeah i'm but actually we, we, just winding it up right now yeah yeah for the for the after 10 years but uh you know it's uh i i, I wonder i don't know how we fell into that have you enjoyed that and do you listen to as much radio when you're not uh working on your radio show as you used to it's interesting i i find sometimes like I need to get away from country and I listen to other things. Like I don't listen to country in my off time. I listen to really maudlin, melancholy, dark oh my uh, singer, songwriter. Don't say it so. It is. It's <laughs> terrible. Or I listen to like Willie's Roadhouse, which is completely classic country. Oh I don't gosh. I don't listen to a lot of mainstream from you know stuff. What's the last concert you went and saw? The last concert I went to see, oh gosh, you're putting me on the spot here. I've got to think about this. I want to, well, I've been on the road and I've been seeing concerts. I, I just, not, 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 I can't be anybody yeah. that I worked with. Oh my God. I mean, that you actually went to like the Bridgestone to see somebody that you just random said, I want to go see this act. I'm trying to think of who it was. I'm, I'm drawing a complete blank. It might have been Dawes. At the Ryman Auditorium. Dawes. <laughs> Dawes. Do you even know who they are? No. No. Killer. Yeah. yeah killer band. Um, cool. But yeah, I, I, I have very eclectic musical tastes and anywhere from jazz to like artists that are a little off the radar, the AAA stuff. Uh, you ever listen to a, 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 a YouTube site called Postmodern Jukebox? Mm -mm. Familiar with that? You heard of a female artist named Haley Reinhardt? No. I check her out. Oh, I will. Uh, she's phenomenal. She's got a cover of uh, Black Hole Sun and uh, Creep. 
Oh, uh, really? Oh, my God. She has such a phenomenal range. But Postmodern Jukebox is pretty cool. I find a lot of really eclectic stuff there. But I like the darker stuff. I'm into heavy metal. And I have I miss so <laughs> much go, of the go, 90s go, metal. Go, go, go. The last time, con- <laughs> I went to Bridge Son of Saw Disturbed. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and before that, I took my daughter. My youngest daughter is into all kinds of crazy stuff. I took her to see Alice Cooper and Rob Zombie. <laughs> How about that? Oh, and, man. And we have tickets to go see... Uh, Billie Eilish in October. Yeah, like yeah. I, I like yeah. I like expanding my horizons musically and just seeing different different people. I've seen like all the older bands like Fleetwood Mac, and I've seen James Taylor and Billy Joel and Paul McCartney yeah. when he came to Bridgestone. Was I cried through the whole thing, and you know, it, I even go back to my own nostalgia as a child and what I was listening to as a kid too when I go to shows. But I also like a lot of the newer stuff too. And but it's it's generally outside of our genre so what was that outside of our genre when you were a kid that you gravitated to oh gosh my mom was a uh my mom was a, she used to sing and play guitar so we listened to a lot of the beatles a lot of fleetwood mac a lot of uh joan Baez, bob dylan but then she had this countryside because my grandparents were professional country musicians they played in bars when she was growing up wow. so there was patsy klein loretta lynn charlie pride um, oh gosh, I remember this Freddie Fender record that she just could not get enough of. And I was Johnny Rodriguez and, uh, I grew up with all of that too. And that introduction to country as a kid, I just absolutely fell in love with it and started to sing country songs. And that's where I was like, I'm going to be a country singer. I knew it. When did you pick 14. up the guitar? I was nine and really? she taught me G seventh, uh, C and G, uh, D three chords. And then I just learned the rest on my own and just started to pick things up by ear. I play really weird chord progression. I, I, I don't play chords or bar chords the way you're supposed to because I didn't get formal training. So I'm like, oh, that sounds about right. I'll just do this. <laughs> and people are like, what are you playing? I'm like, I'm playing my own thing. I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> so I know that you're, uh, you've are you got a new album called uh, Take Two. Is yes. Right? Is yes. it out? Did it just it come out? It came out the end of May and May awesome. 31st. Yep. And uh, uh, you've got a bunch of contemporary artists on there. Cody Johnson, Ashley McBride, Lainey Wilson. Who else is on there? Uh, ben Rector, who's another artist that's outside of country, who is amazing. Uh, do you know Ben? Have I you, do not. He's just phenomenal, phenomenal talent. Uh, but he's been dipping his toe in the country pond here lately. Uh, Carly Pierce. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and Lauren Elena. And Paul Brandt and I did a live recording of Easy on the Eyes when we toured together in Canada last year. So we threw that on this thing, too. But this has been a lot of fun. And if I'm not mistaken, I'm going to toot your horn for a second. I want to say you might have been the trailblazer on this kind of concept. Mm -hmm. I remember you doing a record with other artists of your old, re-recording your old hits maybe 10 years ago. My like 2014, 15, something like that. Um, it was, that that yeah. was before Brooks and Dunn even did their reboot mm-hmm. record. So I think you were kind of a trailblazer with this kind of concept, which is is really cool because, I mean, what we're doing here is not really anything new. But when you did it, it was a new kind of thing. Yeah, and you know there's there's a method to it, too. It's a great way with everything being so social, social media driven and everybody having huge platforms and reaching their particular audience. When you do these collabs like this, it, it kind of bridges the gap between the old and the new mm-hmm. and helps connect you with this younger fan base that's gravitating to all of these new artists because you have access to their fan base mm-hmm. as you put these singles out on social media or however you – choose to go down that road but it's been uh it it, it definitely has uh, had a big impact is it have you can you feel it out there oh sure yeah. definitely you know i i think that i'm playing venues that i might have played five years ago this year that that are have more people in them this year and yeah. um just seeing younger fans coming out and and somebody like laney who has been so kind to me this year we've become really good friends you know singing on the cma fest stage yeah. with her and it being on the tv show and uh Oh, gosh, we did Big Valley Jam, and we got up together to do that. And Ashley and I have, have performed together on stage, and, and I got to honor Lainey at the ACM Honors, where she got an award for winning the most awards. Um, <laughs> Which is always good. You know, I sang Hang Tight, Honey, for her. And it's, it's, it's opened up some doors and, and afforded some opportunities that I may not have had, you know, a couple of years ago. And I've made some new friends. Cody Johnson is... Uh, just oh gosh, I, I'm such a fan of his. I haven't had a chance to meet him yet. But oh man, I, I, I look forward to it oh, at some point. Gosh, I, 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 he is just on fire all the time. I just looked at him and I said, "Do you sleep?" 
at night? <laughs> do you sleep? You either sleep really, really well, or you don't sleep at all. I don't think we slept in the nineties uh, either. Oh uh, no, exactly. <laughs> I know, but that guy sings his ass off. Oh, yeah. Just oh my god! And speaking of not needing tuning or tweaking, he could have walked in and saying, "I just want to be mad one time through," and and we would have been happy with that. He's just such a professional and such a great guy. Such a talent and a great entertainer. I haven't had that. I really want to see him live because I just have a feeling that energy is just crazy. On I've stage. seen a lot of videos of him and he has a great connection with the audience. And yeah. everything that I've heard about the character, that man is, is tremendous yeah. from everybody that's come in contact. The real with deal. Him. He's like, yeah. he's an entertainer like Garth. And I think he's a, he's a cowboy and the real deal like George Strait. Yeah. And I think he's got like McGraw's song sense. It's like he's got, and, and the voice is just outstanding so i'm a big fan and and uh i've made friends with him too and it's nice it does bridge the gap you know people who hear and i just want to be mad as a completely different version it doesn't even sound like the original and it sounds like it was supposed to be a duet all the time it's like a conversation between two people as opposed to you know i'm mad you pissed me off don't look at me don't talk to me they're both going you know i just need some space i just need a minute we're talking to each other and that's a concept that wasn't really part of the deal the first time I recorded it. It was just a one-dimensional thing just coming from one person. So is everything on this old stuff that you've done? All of it is, yeah. Okay. All the old songs. And we we couldn't do them all. And I'm grateful to say I have enough hits that we yeah. couldn't. Eight, eight wasn't enough. That was a TV show in the <laughs> 80s. Eight is enough. Eight, right? is enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, eight wasn't enough. But, you know, that, that leaves room to maybe revisit the concept at some point. Maybe do a few more. We didn't. We didn't have time to do uh, Emotional Girl or A Little Gasoline or some of those other ones. She didn't have time, stuff like that. But there's, uh, hey, that that just leaves it open for interpretation later down the road. I uh, I find it very fascinating just how big country has gotten. You know, in the 90s, we all had respectable careers. Uh, there were just a handful of people that broke out. They were up at that superstar status. You can put Garth up there and, mm-hmm. you know, Reba, Brooks and Dunn. Garth, Brooks that were and doing Dunn. the massive productions right. and doing the big shows. It seems like uh, with Live Nation and, and, you know, there was just a handful of festivals back then, too. You had mm-hmm. Country Thunder and you had uh, Jamboree in the Hills. There was just a handful of them. Now they're everywhere. Yeah. I mean, and, and and people are playing stadiums for two and three nights. He, Luke Combs, didn't he do three nights at, the, at yeah. the Nissan? I mean, it's just the what's happened, the elevation of country music and, and becoming a wor- more of a world brand. We didn't experience that back in the 90s. It's been amazing to see the growth of it. I have the same conversation with people. Like, the growth, and I think the growth is partly, it's, it's partly because of the youth. I mean, the, the, I think when we were out there, it was more of an adult format. I mean, songs that people in their twenties and teens, their parents and grandparents were listening to country music then more than they were. Um, and that has completely shifted. And I think part of it is social media. Part of it is just, uh, I just think country's become more contemporary sounding too. Without um, a doubt, yeah. Uh, and you've got a lot of crossover people coming in. I mean, Post Malone's coming oh, in gosh, doing yeah. country. I mean, Darius has had a phenomenal career with his mm-hmm. transition over. I mean, it's been pretty amazing to see. It's just phenomenal how big it really is. I mean, yeah, guys like Moreland and Wallen have just broken the walls completely down. It's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, well, the kids, the kids love it. You know, and and another thing that I've noticed too, and I, I love talking shop about all this stuff. There's there are people that are that are filling up arenas. I had Cole Wetzel on recently. That guy's selling thousands of tickets a night, and has never really had a lot of radio airplay. Mm-hmm. You know, and it, and I don't. I have a hard time gauging how you uh, how you comprehend exactly how you put your set list together. You know, you have something that goes viral, and then how do you follow that up? Uh, how do you gauge how a record impacts? You know, when you're going through the chart system, you get to feel it progress. You get to feel the energy from the crowd. You get to watch it grow. Mm-hmm. You get to feel it peak out. You get to feel that whole emotional mm-hmm. ride. 
You don't feel that when something pops on the, on social media. And how long does it sustain? How long do you keep it in your show? It seems like people's attention span is very short. So you got to hit them with a whole bunch of stuff real you fast. You got to make all the money right now. Right now. Because you don't know that you're going to be doing it in yeah. 25 years from now. And that that is a big think, question mark. Is that a, and you feel that that's a problem for this younger generation of sure. artists, uh, st- sustainability. I do. I think there are some artists that will sustain. I think the Laney's and Ashley's and Cody's will for sure because they they didn't uh, it was wasn't, they weren't TikTok sensations. They yeah. they really, you know, Laney lived in a camper trailer in Nashville oh, for yeah. 10 years. And Ashley paid every damn bar that there ever was. And Cody's been out there forever doing it the hard way, you know, the grassroots way of building that fan base. But the the ones who are TikTok stars who, who've come along really recently and don't even have a 45-minute set full of songs that they can play and are getting a million dollars to go play this festival over here, um, you know, it... I would be a little nervous if I were in that position. I'd be like, I'd be, you know, like chestnuts in my cheeks with money and trying to make sure to save it all. And just because, you know, you don't know. But you know, when you're young, you don't think like that. (laughs) You don't think like that. When you're young, you don't think like that. No, I'm going to party as hard as I can. I'm going to party. I'm I'm a rock star. (laughs) Woo! Look at me. (laughs) <laughs> yeah well we did that too but no we didn't <laughs> i never did anything like that. no we didn't <laughs> no we didn't. no i didn't i have some pictures here that i'm gonna show you a little bit later <laughs> <laughs> i remember you coming on my bus there was a curling iron sitting right there one of those great big round curling irons and we were all getting ready and you picked it up and you went look one size fits all <laughs> I'm like, True story. Sh- He's a shit. <laughs> <laughs> made you laugh. <laughs> you did. You made me laugh for thirty years, Tracy. That little mischievous glint in your oh, eye. Oh, and I have a twenty-one-year-old daughter that is like a carbon copy of me. Oh, it's good un- lord! Freaking believable. And she's actually working on the road with me now, <laughs> setting up drums and pulling cable wow. and checking guitar. Wow. Oh yeah. You um, got her in the trenches. She wanted to. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Oh man. Yeah, but it's uh, just her mannerisms and the way she walks and the way, and just everything. It's just her whole disposition. It's ridiculous. Does it scare you? A little bit. Yeah. <laughs> it does just a little bit because the world's different now, and you can't mm. get away with the things you used to get away with. And there's oh, cameras no. watching everything. Everything's that you on do film. I tell people everything. if social media had existed when in the '90s, I would have been fired a long time ago. Pretty sure. Yeah. Oh, just, oh yeah. Oh, thank God it didn't. But we had a great time. Oh, I enjoyed did. every moment of it. Me too. And all that crap that people say, oh, if I could go back, I'd do it different. The only thing I'd do is do it harder. <laughs> okay, yeah. Just go hit it harder. <laughs> go hit it harder. <laughs> I do all the things. I do all the things. All the things, things, all the people. It's so much fun. <laughs> hey, we did our darndest to work our way through it all, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. Hey, and my body feels it, let me tell you. I'm, I move oh. a lot slower than what I used to. Oh, God, yeah. I get out of bed in the morning, and everybody's like, you look so young still. I don't sound young. When I turn over in bed, it's like, pop. <laughs> this pops. This sounds like a bowl of Rice Krispies. After all these years, and uh, how do you find balance between the workload and the extracurricular stuff, the radio show and all the things that we do? How do you find balance? What's your outlet? I find that, you know, uh, when I'm working, I'm working. But then I take big blocks of time off. Yeah. And I fish. I have become a fishing addict. Cool. It's it's like I'm obsessed with it. I love fishing. And I've got a place up in Canada on Lake Erie on the Canadian side. So it's one of the great lakes. And it's got some of the best freshwater fishing on the planet. That's walleye. and Everything. Uh, walleye, yeah, largemouth, smallmouth, pike. Yeah. Uh, uh, everything. I mean, you can catch... Any kind of freshwater fish you can name, you can catch on that lake. Salmon, rainbow trout, all kinds of What did you grow up close to? What part of Canada were you from? I grew up in Alberta, which was not near any kind of lake. I grew up on a cul-de-sac, basically. And I've always been a late bloomer. So later in life, I just took up fishing and... I pulled up here in in my camo in my pickup truck, and my friend said, "Keep saying, you know, you're a gun rack away." <laughs> I wish they'd let us put gun <laughs> racks back gun in our rack truck. Away. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I I love I love particularly largemouth bass fishing. But now I'm I've made posts, you know, I post my fishing pictures and stuff, and I've I'm getting all kinds of free gear and tackle and bait, and I don't have to buy it anymore after after i spent a fortune on it i'm starting to get it i'm like 
This is great, but yeah. What's, uh, what's your favorite lake here? I don't fish here. I really? go up there and I fish, and I've, I've fished Percy Priest with guides, and I got to tell you, Tracy, I'm so spoiled. I'll go up there and catch 40 bass in one morning, and I can catch pike, and I, I, I can catch whatever, and I know the lake. I've got my own boat. I'm right on the water. I just get in the boat, and I'm out there, and to get into my car and drive an hour to a lake to hire a guide that I may or may not catch fish with and pay him $500, I've gotten to where it just pisses me off. Yeah. So I'm just not, I don't do it. If I if I could find a lake that I could get to know or could have a boat there or a dock or something, I might do it. But I haven't I haven't gotten that, that far gotcha. in Tennessee yet. Do you hunt at all? No, I do not, but I will eat it. Oh, yeah. I'd probably sit down and cry if I shot an animal. I don't know. Oh. I'm just a bit, a bit of a wimp, but I'll eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing against that. I remember <laughs> when my when my first husband and I were married, he was a hunter. He, he got a deer, and he had this great idea that he was how we were going to skin it. And I helped him with this, and he was hung it from a tree and hooked these things into the skin and then hooked it to the back of the pickup truck and... And he started to drive off while the deer skin was coming off. And I'm like, what has my life become here? <laughs> but it worked. We used to bring the kids out when I'd field dress and skin them out just so they could watch. They, mm -hmm. my, my oldest daughter's not. No, she don't want, she don't like guns. She can't She's not going to do that. Gonna Will do she it. eat it? Uh, yeah, we, we eat a lot of deer meat. I have, mm -hmm. I mean, we've been through all my elk, but I have a, a lot of exotic stuff like fallow and, and oh, really? axis deer. Um, now when my wife and I first got together, she got in my freezer when she first moved up here and she found squirrel and rabbit. She got in your freezer? Got in the freezer. There was like a, a deer head that was Okay, this is going to go. This has got to go. This She's has got to like, go. what is all this? And, and so I'm not allowed to shoot rabbits anymore because they stink up the house really bad. She don't care for the squirrel, so I can't do that. I had frog legs i had salmon from alaska i mean all, all kinds of stuff so I'm, that's that's yeah salmon from alaska uh <laughs> if she's throwing that out then she didn't I have throw to have that out but she a did, conversation the, the rest of it she didn't like the squirrel frog rubber. legs yeah that's that's another thing i've had in my fridge in my life too but that's a whole other have you ever eaten alligator I've not eaten alligator. Alligator's pretty good if it's cooked right. Is it really? Yeah, does it really. taste like chicken? It does not taste like chicken. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. How do you cook alligator? Uh, the the times that I've had it, they'll cook it on a pit and like roast it for a long time like you would a pig. They'll just wrap Ooh. it up and, and roast the whole thing. Like take the little ones like this and just roast them up. And a lot of restaurants down there, and when my wife's from a Beaumont, all down I-10 corridor down there in Louis into Louisiana, they'll uh, do little alligator bites from yeah. the tail and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I see that on many. Menus. menus. I'm playing Louisiana in October. I'll have to look for that. Yeah. I'll take a picture and send it to you. Yeah, just order it and try it. <laughs> I might try it. I'd probably eat that before I'd eat broccoli or Brussels sprouts. I'm a meat eater, so yeah, uh, I'd probably eat alligator before I'd eat any, any weird vegetable. Junior, too. He don't like anything green. I don't eat vegetables. Ain't no point in it. That's why they make and vitamins. And you look so healthy. See, there's that's, nothing wrong with that. They make it's that the, what is it, The carnivore diet. The, the Joe Rogan thing. It works. Y'all check oh, it out. I, I can, Berries and meat. All berries except berries. dingle. Berries and meat. I, I yeah. I got. You're no, not a bear. I got no problem with the tomahawk steak and 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 the bones of it. Just yeah. How many days do you do a year? What do you kind of try to keep it at? How many dates? It yeah. varies. Uh, I, I didn't put a T on there. Dates. Yes, I dates. Said days. Dates. Uh, meaning shows. Uh, this year, I think I'm somewhere around 80, 85. Yeah. Last year, I took the summer off. Like I do, I do the county fairs, outdoor stuff, try to kind of keep it at every other summer so that I'm excited about doing it. It's kind of, it's managing my own expectations and yeah. mental wellness. <laughs> and I love what I do. I love what I do, but make no mistake, you know, there, there, there are some shows I've left where I don't feel very good about myself. And I'm like, I think we all do that. <sighs> yeah. And I'm trying to manage that, you know, I'm, I'm protecting my love for and passion for what I do. And wanting to be excited about it. When the I'm mental doing burnout's it. real too. I think it, it, when you yeah. grind it out through the years, like we went out, we've been on the road since the end of February is when we did our first shows. And I, we took quite a few weeks off scattered through the year. But by about October, I'm typically pretty fried. I'm ready to be done. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I'm just flogging a dead horse from there on yeah. out. And it's summertime. It, that's, that's the busiest time for us is, you know, July, August, yeah. September. We can just 
stay out there and work and work and work and work. Do you work. stay out for weeks at a time still? Um, only on the West Coast or if we go to Canada. Like you yeah. can't you can't like do weekend warrior yeah. stuff to Canada or you're stuck there. But um, I I can do like six to eight weeks across Canada. I did a tour with Paul Brandt. For those of you 90, 90s fans, remember Paul? He's he's a huge deal in Canada, and he's had a, a career that's transcended his American record deal up there. Um, and we did a, an acoustic duo, just me, us and our guitars, and we went across Canada last year, and it was pretty much sold out, and it was hugely successful. So I'm lucky that I have Canada, and I can kind of go back and forth between the United States and Canada and not just – wear this market out yeah. here like over and over again and there there are only so many really great shows you can play here before you're you're starting to to get into some other stuff that like i said and we're grateful for the work that maybe you go oh yeah, maybe i could have skipped that one and i yeah. just working smarter not harder that's that's my motto these days and um i think you know i think some artists uh work a lot and just want to stay out there for whatever reasons they, they feel like they should or want to or need to. Um, and I'm grateful that, that I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do now. And I choose to still do it because I love it. Yeah. And you don't want to push yourself to the point that you kind of fall apart after grinding Absolutely. it out too much. I, right. I don't, I think at our age, you get older, you just realize that there's other things that are a little bit more important. Well, it, it also, I think lengthens your, uh, can length, lengthen your marketability as as a touring artist. If uh, it's good to stay not, out of markets for a little exactly, bit, exactly. If you go hit them every exactly single year, saying. there's nothing special or unique yeah. about you coming back. Well, I to saw town. her a year ago. Yeah. I saw her here two years ago. Like you know, I, I think if you space it out a little bit more and you're a little smarter about it and you say no a little more often, then you can go in and they're more excited to see you again. Or you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna go in and sell half the tickets you sold last time. You're gonna sell twice as many or whatever. How's so. the, how's the European market been to you? I don't, I don't tour Europe a lot. Um, last time I did anything over there was really 2011. I want to say I did yeah. the UK. I did some stuff in Scotland and England and it was more acoustic based. I've done some, you know, stod in, you know, we've all done yeah. Switzerland and interlocking and mm -hmm. some, I haven't done C2C yet, which I'd love to do. Uh, but I would like to do more there. I, I, I feel like I've got a great um, Canadian market and can do some, you know, stuff here. But to have a, another option would be great because I, I think if, if we if we do have other options and other audiences, it's a big world out there. We don't have to hammer the same places and things over and over and over again. And that uh, it seems like that European market's grown. We're, I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to go do more of it. I haven't beat it up at all. I mean, well, let's there's, go. Go, there's guys like, uh, you know, the Bellamy, together. the Bellamy brothers have killed yeah. it. I'd oh, love, I'd love to go. They over are there. the masters of the European market. They, they are have, huge. Over they there. are absolutely huge. Yeah. And, and guys like Kip Moore, they say Kip Moore selling out freaking football stadiums in South Africa. South I'm not kidding you. They, they had a radio station over there that just played his entire album, and he blew up. And he goes over there, and he sells like twenty something thousand Who freaking knew? tickets. And yeah, you you can be a huge deal in one country, and uh, not that Kip Moore's not here. He obviously is, but oh, yeah. but it's it's so weird. Like even in Canada, we've got huge stars in Canada that nobody knows here, but have, they're selling thousands of tickets up, and it's it's just right there. <laughs> it's, it's just, just right. it's just yeah, right there. Have you done it's, Australia? It's, it's, You've done I've Australia, done Australia. Right? I've been to Australia twice, and I played it once. And uh, but we didn't. I want to go back over there and do the whole East Coast run. They say there's casinos and theaters and stuff up the yeah. East Coast. You can go over there and do a couple of weeks. I played the uh, some winery there, and we wound up staying about ten days and just doing one show and kind of sightseeing and stuff. But I haven't had a chance to work that country a lot. I've been there twice, and it's one of those markets you have to keep going back to build your audience. And yeah. I after the second time. I, for whatever reason, I thought, God, this is a long way. So check this out. This is a that long way. We're going to try this, and this would fall in line with your your collaboration record that you did. We're going to try to get my album that we did and get Australian artists to do the duets and release that over there and then follow it up with the tour. Well, aren't you thinking? See, we could do that. That's very smart. We could do that. And then you could, yeah. will they sing with a southern accent or an Australian know. accent? Will but, they be like Keith Urban? <laughs> but he doesn't sing with an Australian accent. No, he accent. doesn't. He doesn't and I don't, you know. 
know? <laughs> yeah, I, I was from Canada and I, I came out of the boxing and changed my new guitar strings. <laughs> I, I blame twang? Reba. I blame Reba and Ricky Skaggs for my, my accent that wasn't quite legit, but uh, I'd been around in Nashville long enough to claim it, I guess. Are there any of these really new artists that are just starting to come out that are intriguing to you? Oh gosh! Well, I named. I wouldn't say Laney and Cody are just now. Yeah, they're kind of. They're kind of out there. Superstars um, at this point. And as far as, you, are you familiar with Zach Top? Have you, oh my God, he's awesome! Yes, I was going to say like he is the real deal. So the first time I mean, I he heard, walks the walk, sings the song, oh and talks the talk. Yeah. I mean, I, you can close your eyes when you hear that kid sing, yeah. and you can hear Ricky Skaggs. Yeah. You can hear. Uh, uh, Daryl Singletary. You can hear Keith Whitley. Yeah. I mean, you can hear all those things in his voice. He's got little things that he does. It's like, that's unbelievable yeah. how good he really is. He he listened to the right stuff growing oh, up. Oh, yeah. And I he's mean, a great musician, too. Yeah, he's a great he's, guitar player. Yeah. He's, he's like, he, he plays as, as well as Brad Paisley and any of these artists who, who play guitar, you know, and, and he, he, he's got the look. He I did a festival with him. Where were we? Oh, hottest day at Watershed this year, the Gorge in uh, Washington State. It was 104 degrees on stage. Oh. He was on uh, before me. I went on at 6, and I think he was on at like 3 or 4 in the afternoon. Sun hit him right in the face. Let me just tell you, dude is walking around backstage. The Wranglers are starched, the boots, long sleeve snap down shirt, hat. And I'm talking like the old style 90s shirts that are really thick. I, I thought he, he deserves a medal for just not getting heat stroke in that outfit. He's walking around backstage just like in this getup. And I'm like, I don't, I could, didn't know how he did it. I guess, how old is he? He's got to be early, mid 20s. Oh, okay. He hasn't hit menopause yet. That's Dude, how he did it. Menopause. <laughs> <laughs> Have you coined that phrase? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think so, but probably not. <laughs> Junior has to look everything up for me because I can't. Are you a right Google up. guy? Well, it's, the Google? It's trying to load. I don't know what's going on. Ah, uh, my cell service. Remember, remember when we used to have to get maps out to figure out how to get to places? And when we'd get lost, we'd call it touring the fans' home. <laughs> <laughs> we'd drive through subdivisions of these buses with limbs scratching down Do the side. Do you ever have <laughs> people pull up around here, like, looking for your house? Have you ever had anybody so, in the uh, gray line tour? I used to live in the house. Just before you come in our gates, there's another house with a brick wall in front of it. That was my first house. Oh, really? And then I bought all of this land around here over She's the years. And yeah. we built our house back here. So when, when we lived of there, the you know they used to have the tour buses that would come around see the stars homes, and I had one that show up at my house every afternoon, and all old people get out and take their pictures and oh, stuff, God. and I'd go out there and sign autographs. Sometimes I mean every day they would show up. Does that still ha do they still I, have these I, things? They don't, they don't come out here. They I mean, do the kids do the, do the kids these days care about where? Seeing people's all houses. they care is about a thirty second TikTok. That's about well, all. Well, I know that's what I'm saying. I just don't. I don't know that they have the patience to actually sit in a bus no. for thirty minutes to go see. They could house. pedal a beer cart around downtown. That's about it. Oh God, the Woo Girls. <laughs> Woo! Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, the I live way too close to downtown. For I that. couldn't take that. Well, I'm I'm thinking of actually. I moving. thought you had a place outside of town. Like I did. What? Oh, you're you're four houses ago. Oh Kane Brown Lord. bought my house. I built a house ground up on twenty eight acres about in twenty fifteen. And I ended up selling it for various reasons, and he ended up buying it from me. And uh, he actually got lost on the land one time. Oh, Remember that? One. That was yeah. my house, yeah. And then uh, I wanted to move into town, so I moved into town, and now I'm in town, and now I want to be back out again. And it's just, I don't know. It just, it, it you feel congested, like having. What was your motivation for making that switch to back to downtown? Were you wanting to participate in the adult nightlife? Well, or? it's well, now I'm closer <laughs> to downtown, but I, I actually lived over in uh, more like the West Mead area and I had gotcha. two acres in town and it feels like you're in the country, but uh, life changes when, when uh, my life changes, my houses tend to change. So, you know, and uh, now I'm now I'm like oh gosh well maybe I I need to get more space again and more privacy I can watch my neighbor watching the Olympics on TV I can see what you know hey she's watching the the deadlifting uh, thing through my blinds oh, no. <laughs> that's how close she is <laughs> I'd have a hard time with that oh most people would yeah. but 
right. yeah but I, you know there's there's a time for all of that i mean there's i could see me in my 20s wanting to live downtown with all the excitement and energy and the restaurant scene and all and the, the puke and the and the, blood and, and guts and, and the woo girls and well all, i had, all i that. worked i worked at tootsie's organ lounge for tips i played for tips down there in 1987 and that was when lower broad wasn't so nice it wasn't nice it was boarded up it was abandoned yeah. there were there were tumbleweeds rolling down lower broadway um the I only know. the only people down there <laughs> were seriously 80 year olds getting off of the uh the greyhound tour bus to come into now we're gonna park Ernest at Tubbs record shop yeah yeah come come back uh and you, you got 30 minutes and i was the talent at one o'clock <laughs> got in the 30 afternoon. minutes don't get yeah, lost 30 miles, don't get lost and you know they would come in and in in a in this mad fury of seeing tootsie's orchid lounge and i'd get a few tips and they'd leave and it'd be empty again and uh it was a very different time, and I took the city bus down there because I didn't have a green card, so I couldn't get a social security number, so I couldn't get a car because I couldn't get a license. Alien? I was an illegal <laughs> alien. I'm not anymore. I'll have you know, everybody out there who's listening, I've paid my share of taxes. Um, but no, it's it was a whole different, whole different vibe. It was dangerous in it was a different very way. Dangerous, yes. Um, so I'd never played there at night, so I was also very broke because. <laughs> I, I used to love to go drink. to Printer's Alley, but I never wanted to go alone. I mean, right. I love to go to the Blues Bar, and, and you know, there was always great Didn't you music. go to the Rose Room and hang out there and play the there Rose a room, lot? That was more in Hermitage, right? Uh, the Rose Room was just off Stewart's Ferry Pike. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, my other two places were the Broken Spoke, which is right oh, up yes. Trinity Lane yes. and in front yep. of the Ramada Inn, mm -hmm. and then Gabe's, which was the little mm -hmm. cinder block bar behind uh, the Spoke. I remember all, all of, all of those places. All of that is gone now. What year did you come to town? I got here in uh, the fall of two thousand uh, of nineteen ninety is when I got here. Oh gosh! So I yeah. beat you by three years, yeah. but it, it it hadn't changed that much by the time you got here. But Lower Broadway didn't really start to turn around. I think until like until the convention center and the hockey arena and all of that started to slowly but surely it started to a revival down there of sorts and people started buying bars and but this whole thing with all the country stars licensing their names and all of, it's that's that's definitely a, a new thing yeah it's almost like a vegas, a vegas without slot machines yeah you it know it's like vegas. the bachelorette parties and all that stuff i can't i can't go down there a lot do you it's, it's too much for me it's I used, overwhelming i me. used to go and hang out in tootsies just to you know, just because it it felt good to be in that place I started, it, it kind of brought me back home again, back to the beginning of where this started and, and gave me such a feeling of gratitude just sitting in there. Because that, that main floor level of Tootsie's has not changed a bit. They haven't yeah. altered it at all. I would still stare at that same bar that I stared at when I was 18 years old, singing Patsy Cline, Loretta Lynn songs to an empty place, watching limos go by, taking people to the CMA Awards, crying. And because uh, I wanted to be part of it so much, but going back after you've done what you came to do and then sitting there, it's just such an overwhelming feeling of gratitude and humility and and just like awe. I can't believe that that actually happened, but I can't do it. Any, I, it's it's really hard to go down there. I get claustrophobic. Everybody's hammered. It's you can't really. It, it's just it's just a I different can't, thing. I can't deal with all of the crowd stuff. I mean, I, uh, I even when uh, when I was running the bars and stuff when I was younger, I never liked the big stuff. I wanted to go where the road musicians and the songwriters were. That was what I loved about the Spoke and Gabe's and the Rose Room and all that stuff. That's where you know Alan Jackson, guitar player, would be, and and the great steel players that played on all these records. Sonny Gary should pop in from time to time, and Ron Sweet was playing bass and singing Ray Price yeah. songs yeah, all yeah. freaking not down. That's that's. Uh, that's and, the, and it's the all changed because anything and and it was like we had our own little places that were yeah. that the tourists really didn't go. Yeah. And nowadays, I think it's almost impossible to have something yeah. like that because if it happens and and all yeah. those cool people show up, somebody's going to post something about it and, and it's going to ruin it. Yeah. The the uh, beside the Shoney's there on Demumbrian, the the best Western lounge or whatever it was, they had writers. The Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame. Yeah. The Hall of Fame. Uh, Gosh, I, that was one I had my own table there because <laughs> I wrote my name on it. <laughs> yeah, I had my own table. Tracy's table. That's right. Tracy's we, table. A Monday chart night. So what God. was what was your big break? I've never we've never talked about this. Tell me what happened when you got your deal and how all that happened. Oh, it took eight years. I came to town in 87 and didn't get my deal till 94. And I had, you know, 
I got married. I got uh, I, I I started waiting tables and selling cowboy boots at Boot Country. Same guy hired me to sell cowboy boots and Western apparel that Harry hired Garth Brooks when he came to town. He hired Garth and Sandy at Cowtown Boots. Ed Smith was his name. He hired me to work at Boot Country in Hendersonville. Um, I was writing songs, uh, starting to, uh, you know, co-write with people in town. So after I'd wait tables or get off my day job or whatever, I would go and write with people until 10 o'clock at night. Um, did some writer's nights and things like that. But a guy named Brian Kennedy took me into the studio, I want to say it was sometime around 1992, and recorded. He had he was working with MCA Publishing and they gave him a budget to find an artist that he really believed in to produce five songs on. So he had heard a demo tape uh, of me and and heard something he loved. And uh, Brian's dad was Jerry Kennedy, who produced all the early Reba McIntyre records for Mercury Records. And Brian took me in and produced this this cassette <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of uh, five tracks. And he had Carl Jackson on this session. Jim Vest, uh, Vince Gill came and sang on it. Carl got Vince to come sing a background vocal on it. And this thing floated around town for a few years. And somewhere along the way, uh, Keith Stegall heard it. And in that time period, I had also uh, got a publishing deal as a writer with Sony Tree. So I was then making $350 um, was it a month or a week? It might have been a month. I don't remember. But I was able to quit my waitressing job and just focus solely on songwriting. And then, um, so this thing was floating around out there. Keith Stegall hears it and called me in to uh, come and meet with him at his studio and sing live. So I took my guitar over and sang for Keith. And Keith was producing, produced the Randy Travis Storms of Life record and all of that stuff. And Alan Jackson, he was producing Alan Jackson at the time, who was... Nobody was bigger than Alan Jackson in yeah. 1992. So um, I was nervous and I went and sang for him and he said, gosh, I would love to work with you someday. I just, I don't have the time right now. And I thought, oh, there it is. There's the big, there's the big, but, you know, and I thought, well, I thought that went well, but he's, he was producing other females that he, he was trying to get record deals for and on other labels and he didn't have time to do it. Six months later, I got a phone call and he and and it was Keith and he said I've I've gone to Mercury Records as the head of A&R and you're the first artist I would like for Luke Lewis to hear the president of the label. So I marched in with my guitar again and sat in a boardroom and sang for Keith and Luke. Um I did I had one song that wound up on my first record I already had If I Were You and I sang some covers and I sang some stuff I'd been writing and they called the next day and offered me a record deal. And I had already been offered what they called then a spec deal by Sony. Uh, Paul Worley and Blake Chancey offered to basically produce four songs and see how it went. And so when Keith called and I sang for him and Luke and they said they offered me a full-fledged like deal to make full albums. And after eight years, a lot of tears, I'd been turned down by every label at that point. So it, it wasn't quite that easy how that story oh, goes. But there were a lot of... A lot of people turned me down and I sang for a lot of different heads of record labels and boardrooms and heard how great I was, but then didn't get, didn't get the, uh, the contract. So this was, and I couldn't relax till the ink was dry on that thing. So how long, how long of a deal did you sign when you did that first contract? I believe it was, uh, I want to say it was five albums. Five albums, you know, with options. Five options. Options, yeah. yes. They're, they're options. They, they, they always <laughs> control all of it. Right. You know, it. I, I would be hard-pressed if I didn't say that I would be, it'd be very difficult for me to walk back into the major label system now the way these contracts are with these new artists. Oh, yeah. They, it's all yeah. controlling. They, yep. They're getting a piece of everything. 360 deal. Yeah. I mean, that's your merch and everything. You still pay all the overhead. You pay all the cost. And, and But it's just, it's a little bit difficult for me to stomach. Yeah, it, it, it was a different time. I mean, we we have platinum records hanging on our walls of actual physical sales. Yeah, that it's it's a it's a weird thing to fathom that streams are now being counted towards like 
I wish they paid the way album sales did. And they don't. Me for it. No, they don't. And they're nowhere they close. They don't. But the artists are making 10 times more than we were. And artists at our level live back wise. then, live, like touring. And artists that, and inflation also plays into this as yeah. far as the dollars making sense goes. But it's, uh, they, they, I, I hear the numbers that some of these people, well, and I'm it's, just it's like, overwhelming you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I never saw anything like some of the numbers I hear. Oh, and never. it's not just one or two of them. Like you know, you heard these numbers year. for Garth. I mean, but that right. was back when Garth said, "I'm not put selling a ticket for over twenty five dollars." You remember yeah. all that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you ain't doing that no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, Nobody no, is. No, nobody's doing that. You know, that. you go to a three day festival, it's four five hundred bucks. Oh, yeah. per person. You know, yeah. it's it's uh, but they're but it's it's just a different day and age, and it makes me sad to go to Music Row too. There used I used to call it this little city oh. in the middle of this big town. Everybody ran up down the alleys. I knew everybody that wrote it, the yep. publishing companies. I knew who ran this. The hot I knew the, the picnic sec- parties on the lawns <sighs> for number ones. And the- I know, and I you know oh. I knew people at just about every label. You know, it was just it was just a fun time. We'd go around on chart night and pop in to see this one or that one, and go to the Hall of Fame and sit down and wait for the numbers to yeah. come in. It was just different. It was different. I I. You know, it. I actually get teary when I go down there now. Like I, I seriously sit there and I look around and I'm like, well, making music was there and that was there and that's where so and so was. And I remember yeah. they had a, a big old picnic party for Alan Jackson's number one in like 1990 on that lawn and at, at Sony Tree, the fire hall. I wrote all those hits there and oh, yeah. wrote with people and it, it's just. It was this little community of all these little houses that have been torn down and yeah. they've put up condos and we sound like we're 80. You know that, right? But I don't care. Yeah, back then it's I went to nice school uphill rap- both ways in the snow. No shoes. Well, no shoes. And then backwards. <laughs> backwards. But it's, you know, and that trolley that used to ride around on Demumbrian. And Demumbrian was full of really creepy things like the uh, George Jones Collectors, Car Collectors Hall of Fame and the Wax Museum and the Spaghetti Deli and the Wax Museum were t- and the hound one dogs. and the same. Right? Oh, the hot and dog like, stand that was The hot right, dog, the that was right, long hot dog that stand. That was right there. Chesney used to work there. Everybody, oh that, my God, where, really? That's where Kenny worked right there where the fountain used to be. That's the naked people now, the roundabout. The naked people. Yeah. I, I played the Gillies Beer Garden up there when oh, the Gillies yeah. was there. Uh, that, was, that was a gig I had other than the one at Tootsie's in Guy walked in one day and I'm playing out in the beer garden. I'm playing I Fall to Pieces or something. And dude has a heart attack right in front of me and dies. My very first day at Gilly's in the beer garden. I'm like, well, I guess this is what country songs are all about. His name was. Uh, did you write a song about it? No. <laughs> His name was Johnny Dreamer. He was a, a songwriter. There they were, they were characters living in their cars in the parking lot at Gilly's. Whatever they were, happened they were, to Johnny Dreamer? That's a great song. I, I know it is. It is. <laughs> Uh, but I, I listened to I listened to this podcast called uh, Murder on Music Row the other day, and it's about um, a guy named Kevin who was one of one of the guys that ran Cashbox Magazine. Oh, I remember when all that in happened, the late eighties, and he him. got mm-hmm. shot. Mm-hmm. Listen to this podcast if you're like on a road trip or something. It's fascinating. I think there are seven episodes, but they go through the whole thing, and you'll hear about. All these characters that would hang out at the Shoney's with their business cards trying to scam money off young artists. You know, their parents would go mortgage their house to to make a record on them and nothing would ever happen. And it, it covers a lot of that underbelly of Nashville and what it was like in the late 80s, early 90s. And I'm surprised I survived that without something weird happening. You know, oh, I was a, a kid doubt. by myself from a foreign country with my family 2,000 miles away. Uh, it's how did your family deal with that when you left? Oh gosh! I'm, I mean, as a as a dad, I would have been mortified. Yeah, my mom mostly was was she believed in my talent and she knew how bad I wanted it and how passionate I was about it. I didn't go to college. I was like, I'm going to Nashville. So for three years, we planned on it. She drove me across the border with her best friend in a Honda Civic, and we told the border officials we were going to the Grand Ole Opry. I had everything I owned in the back seat of this Honda Civic. Remember the days you could put everything you owned in the back seat of a car? Yeah. Life was simple. Um, and I found a, a room to rent for really, really cheap in exchange for babysitting. This uh, woman was separated from her husband and her son was two and she worked the the graveyard shift at the factory. And so I would babysit at night and um, I'd call my mom, collect a lot. This was before cell phones. This was before Facebook or Internet or any of that. Uh, so it was collect phone calls and... I, I remember just, I remember getting off at the wrong bus stop with my guitar in June. I got off at uh, the Hardee's at Nolensville Road 
and Thompson Lane, I believe it was. That's a rough Harding, area too. Or Harding, yeah. That Nolensville Roads. Yeah. I cool. thought I was at my stop and I wasn't. Ooh, that's a rough place. So the buses keep going by and I'm standing there and I'm Canadian. I'm not even used to humidity and I'm sweating. I'm in What's all up, of this eh? stuff, right? What's <laughs> up, eh? And the buses are going by. I start crying. Finally, a bus stops and he opens his door and he goes, what do you, what do you, I'm flagging them down. And he said, the bus you're looking for, is it that going to stop over there? And so I went and wait, and I got home from that particular day. I called my mom and just had a meltdown. And I said, I want to come home. I just, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I'm strong enough to do it. And she said, and talk about the strength of a parent knowing their child is out on their own. I mean, in, in not even, it wasn't like I could go home for Sunday dinner. I mean, 2,300 miles from home. And not even just across the border. The, I was in the south, the deep south of the United States. I was. Yeah. There were so many cultural differences and so many food differences, climate differences. I didn't know anybody. I was just having a meltdown. She said, I'll say one thing. If you want to come home, anytime you want to come home, I support that. But just remember how long you you dreamed and every CMA award show you watched and how much you wanted to go to Nashville since you were 14 years old. And I just want you to think about being 50 years old and having any regrets. I don't want you to look back and wish that you had given it a real shot. And so I didn't go home. And right around that time, I had started to make some friends. My, my very first serious boyfriend who I ended up marrying, his family were just lovely. And they took me in. They had a farm in Franklin, Kentucky. And um, his sisters became like my sisters. And I, I, I honestly think without them, I probably, I may not have survived. I may have gone home. And, and I just felt like I was, I, I had a safety net. So thank God for them. Um, and it's, it, yeah, I, I'm glad I, I'm glad I took my mom's advice and thought twice about it, but it was still another eight years after that before anything really happened. But all along the way, I always had believers. There were always people, you know, fringe people in the industry or people that were in management or always kind of pushing me and, and pushing me along and saying, look, you've got it. You you need to just, it's going to happen. Hey, it's Randy gonna Travis happen. was turned down sometimes twice by every label in town Yeah, before exactly. he finally got a deal. Yeah, exactly. So what, what when you get asked by these kids, like we all do, if there's a, a young Canadian female that's 17, 18 years old that comes to your show and she says, give me advice, what should I do? Mm. What's your advice to that girl? I always tell them to surround themselves with people who will tell the truth, not yes people, not your cousin or your aunt or your uncle that are going to think everything you do is good. But people will tell you the truth and really work hard on your craft and also work with people who are better than you are, who you think sing better than you, who write better than you, who you can actually learn something from. There's, there's, to me, there's nothing to be gained by being the best person in the room. It's like golfing. If you're going to be a better golfer, you want to golf with people that are better than you, that you have to rise to that occasion. And I think that's important, um, you know, and, and just staying true to yourself. And not not trying to conform to be somebody else. Don't be a carbon copy of. We already have a Laney Wilson now. Don't go be Laney Wilson. Be your own person and and cut that path because that's what will inspire other people that come up behind you. How often do you get that question? All the time. Yeah. All the time. Um, and and sometimes my answer is different depending on where I may be. I've I've all kinds of advice, you know, but. Uh, I find it, for young women, it's particularly hard. And I know that the scales have tipped a little bit more here in the last year or two with people like like Lainey and Megan and Kelsey. And uh, but it's it's still a more male dominant dominated uh, format and at radio. And it, it's 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 tougher for girls. And they're they're working their asses off out there and they're doing they're in in vans in the middle of the night and having to get up at 5 a.m. and go into radio stations, just exhausted, exhausted, yeah. um, getting cat called about their boobs on stage and stuff. And, you know, a friend of mine, Megan Patrick, went through something like that. And we, you know, I, I, I've taken some midnight phone calls from these girls that are in tears before. And, and we've had some really in-depth conversations about music, about how hard it is on them, on their bodies, on their, on their emotions. Um, and I've heard it's uh, tough. Th there used to be some horror stories about some of these male jocks and radio that were pretty disgusting. Oh yeah. I, I, you know, I, 
I didn't experience it. I was too busy trying to arm wrestle them for ads. Um, <laughs> <laughs> went to a couple strip clubs with them and the promotion staff from the label a few That's times. That's always though. fun. Yeah. yeah, well, here we are. Woo, okay. Um, but yeah, those were the days. I'm pretty sure that probably still happens, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I would like to think that it doesn't happen as much as it used to yeah. because the world is all out there on social media. And you would think that, that we've grown past a lot of that stuff at this I point. Think, I think that everybody has to mind their P's and Q's a little bit more and yeah. be careful. Like, I've always been that person professionally to an extent. Like, I pick my parties uh I've never had a drink before going on stage in my life, I've ne and I've never had a drink on stage. And I've been that way since Tootsie's Orchid Lounge when I was 18. And I just, when the when the lights go down and, and, and I'm doing my thing, but when they come back up again, all bets are off. I've done plenty of shows hungover. <laughs> I don't like that feeling because, you know, I've, I've seen the sun come up on the bus after playing Billy Bob's more times than I can count. Yeah, but you don't um, go on till eleven o'clock there. So all right, okay. I know, you know. So yeah, you know, at four o'clock you're just getting yeah. ramped up with the bus party. But, but yeah, I mean, and and I think I've always been nervous about just losing something I wanted so bad for saying the wrong thing or or just doing the wrong thing. Um, and now with social media, I I. I, I well, you, we see people getting in trouble all the time oh, <laughs> because of yeah. social media. Stop throwing the chairs off the top of buildings. Uh, who who did that? <laughs> so you had mentioned something a while ago, and I want to go back to it about cultural differences. What are the few? What did you grow up eating when you were a kid? What was <laughs> how different is that? A lot of maple syrup. Really? <laughs> no. uh, we had things like. You know, we had food that obviously you have here, the normal staples like steak and potatoes and roast chicken and roast beef. Oh, My mom used so, to make yeah. all of that. But, you know, you get into the South and you've got your catfish stuff and you've got your grits and you've got your biscuits and gravy, this white lumpy oh. gravy that I'd never seen before. Oh. You ever seen chocolate gravy? No. Biscuits and chocolate gravy for breakfast? Oh, my Oh, really? God. Chocolate gravy? Oh, that sounds done that. intriguing. Does it doesn't sound That sounds southern. intriguing. And people, like, I'd go to, like, parties where they'd have this entire pig on this thing with its head and everything. And yeah. I was just like, what in the actual is going on here? I could see that this animal's staring at me. Um, You're supposed to eat the eyes. <laughs> oh! Oh! <laughs> Oh man, yeah, like uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I still enjoy just that. just stuff that you collard greens and southern cooking and meat and threes. I'd never heard of any of that. We I grew up eating, you know, pierogies and cabbage rolls and you know just a lot of maple flavored things. <laughs> <laughs> You know, lots but, of yeah, syrup up there. I, I even tattooed it on my arm. I love maple so much, but uh, yeah. Uh, so, so there was a, ver a very different thing. I mean, I found um, wow, just there was more racial tension here. I didn't grow up with any of that. Like, I, di I did not, at least not as much an African American white racial tension as there was with some other et ethnic groups in Canada. Um, so th there was uh, just the lines were more defined, uh, socioeconomic borders and lines within cities and towns. And, oh, that's the bad part of town. You don't go over there. This is the, you know, there was more of that. Like I didn't experience as much of that there. So there were a lot of differences that um, and it was. Oh my God, balls hot here! I was just like, Oh God! Oh jeez! Oh jeez! Hey, I'm just dying up here. You melt your cheese curds Ooh. down here. Yeah, yeah. No, that's Wisconsin. You got the wrong. That's it's just below the border. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's. But growing up in Alberta, Alberta was just cattle ranches everywhere. Big beef. No wonder why I like beef so much. But um, I, I, we ate a lot of that growing up. Um, but yeah, like the heat, the humidity of the South. It's still, it's oh, still. Oh, it's worse. Oh, it's my Lord. So how cold does it get in the winters up there? Oh, where I grew like up? Like 100 below or something? Um, well, <laughs> if you're speaking in Celsius language, which the rest of the world, but you people do. Um, <laughs> it would have to be different. Yeah. Uh, it, it, once we got to about minus 25, minus 30, minus 35, sometimes minus 38, that's when I'd get a ride to school and I wouldn't have to walk. There was a certain, there was a barrier that we would hit with the below temperatures where, we, no, you're not walking to school because you're going to get frostbite. 
no matter. And I, I remember walking Jeez. to school with scarves wrapped around my head and just, just enough for me to be able to see out of like like Christmas story, the guy that puts his his he's waddling down the street. Put your eye out. Just, yeah, yeah, get your tongue stuck on the pole. I actually did that one time. Did you really? Oh, I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> And it wasn't because of the movie. I just wanted to see. It was just like him. And I'm like, oh, this is not going to end well. So a layer or two later off my tongue, I was like, oh, I'm not going to I'm not going to do that again. I I was 16. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so how long do you think you'll keep doing this? Oh, as long as as people keep asking me that. I, I, do they ask you that question? All the time. I'm like, why are you asking me that question? I mean, I wonder sometimes why I get asked the question. Maybe over a certain age, people start thinking because normal people, regular people retire at 65. I, that doesn't happen for us. No, it doesn't. No. That's a great thing about our fan base. So they'll follow you for a long, long time. They will. And it, it, country music is just beautiful in that way that when you make that fan base and you build that fan base, they will stay with you for oh, a yeah. really long time. And the bigger the fan base is, the longer I think you can go because... You've got more of them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Toby Keith told me one time, Miss Toby, um, he said, you got eight years before your last hit starts to fade. Eight <laughs> years and people will start, start to forget about you outside of your core fan base. And I think there's a certain amount of truth to that for artists that didn't become global superstars like, like a Toby or a Brooks and Dunn or Garth Brooks or Reba. You know, everyone knows who they are. They're... Uh, you know, for people that, that, I mean, you've had what, 17 number one records or something. You've got a, a, a show stacked full of hits. I would kill for 17 of those, but it's, uh, but there's a certain, there's a certain, I guess, box of artists that that could be true for. But I think if we stay on the road and we keep doing what we're doing, it's harder for them to forget. And now with 90s coming more popular and all of these prime country shows and, and radio shows that are featuring 90s country only, I think that's giving us a bit of a, a resurgence and a boost that is going to lengthen that eight-year... Well, I mean, Girls Lie 2 was my last hit, and that was 2004. And I'm still out here, and I'm having a better year this year than I've had since 1998. Isn't that amazing? And so th that's not necessarily. But but you know. I think uh, how much? What do you do in regards to social media? I mean, they, they take great care of me. Yeah. But I mean, but I mean, that's this this generation. They're posting multiple times sure. a day. They're doing. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I, yeah. That cuts into my quality of life. I mean, that there's absolutely. That, that's why you pay her to tools. do it. These are business tools, <laughs> and and I respect the people yeah. that do follow it. Yeah. You know, religiously like what a lot of people do. But it's there. There's this younger generation. And they feel like they have to stay connected all the time. I don't. I don't. I think that has a lot to do with the growth of the industry. Mm -hmm. But I mean, how do you utilize utilize all of it? I uh, I do what they tell me to do. I, I mean, <laughs> I don't even have the TikTok talk app on my phone. Am I allowed to say that? I really don't. Yeah. But uh, there are marketing teams who specialize in social media oh, marketing, yeah. and uh, you and I both have the same one. Uh, yes. They have several artists, and they do a fantastic job. You, you pay them and it's an investment in your brand and your career that will make you money on the road because you're staying visible, but it will not take away from your quality of life where you're not sitting there all day long trying to think of content ideas. They Cuts also, into your fishing time. It, well, <laughs> but I do videos fishing and I can knock some stuff out at the same time that is really engaging for people while I'm enjoying my off time. I have to figure out a more efficient way to do it because I've got this tripod thing that sits on the windshield of my boat. And I'm alone out there. And at some point, my phone's going to wind up in the lake. I just, <laughs> a wave's going to come up and that thing's going to toddle over. I've thought about getting a GoPro or something. But yes, you know, you, you, I do some videos, but they edit them together and they, they help with all of that stuff. And it's, I think they're, it's a valuable tool to have because you have to do it. Uh, now, at, at, really at least do. on some level, if you're on not going to do it, you have to have somebody that's going to do it for right. you. It, it's exactly. too important to keep your brand value up and to keep you engaged in what's going on out there. Absolutely. Because yeah. And and to answer your question about how long I'll do this for, I, I've, I've answered this several times recently because I've done a lot of media around the, the album. I think as long as I can walk out on stage and represent and honor that kid that came to Nashville and represent the artists that came out in 1995. No, I'm not going to be wrinkle-free for the rest of my life. Um, I, you know, 
go out there with the same exuberance and energy and joy and passion for what I do and touch people's lives and have them still connecting with that person that they first connected with in 1995 or 1998 or whatever it was. I think I will keep doing it. With all the uh, the highs and lows that come with the business, what what is a highlight that stands out in your mind and what's one of the darkest periods of your career, not your personal life, but your career you had to fight through? Mm. Oh, gosh. Oh, there are so many high times. Becoming an Opry member yeah. was a highlight. Um, these are like milestones. You know, you work and you work and you work and you think that something like that happens and mate, this is going to be the last great thing that ever happens. But and it then just puts you in else. such great company with all the legendary people that have come before you. That's one of the great accolades about those Absolutely. things. Absolutely. You know, becoming a member of the Canadian Music Hall of Fame last year, along with like Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and people like that. It's not, it's outside of the country realm. That was a real honor because, you know, the last country act that went into the, the Canadian Music Hall of Fame was Shania Twain in 2011. So that meant a lot to me. And just... I'm proud of where I'm from, you know, and, and my mom always instilled in me patriotism and to be proud of where I came from. Uh, and America has been phenomenally wonderful to me. So I'm a dual citizen, but to that, for that happening, that was an, an incredible thing. Darkest period. Oh gosh. Oof. Career wise. I, I, I'm a firm believer in fate and things kind of happening for a reason. I, there, there was a point at which I got off Mercury Records and I and I went to another label for a while, another major label. I made a whole album with Garth Fundus that I was really proud of. And we released a couple singles and they just didn't fly at radio and the album got shelved and it never came out. To put that much work into a record, and this record was a work in progress for a couple of years, and to not have it come out was, you know, yeah. um, it sucked. So... I basically just decided I was going to focus on the Canadian market for a while and not keep trying to beat a dead horse at radio in the States. Like some of us have an expiration date at radio. Not everybody is going to be Tim McGraw and Kenny Chesney and, you know, these people who just never seem to, it never ends. They just keep going with hit songs. Uh, but, you know, I felt like there was, there was an expiration date and that was going to be that. So it was okay. I'm going to, write songs and produce records for the Canadian market. And I, uh, cause I always felt like Canada kind of got left behind when I was doing so much in, in America and I didn't do as much, you know, media and stuff like that and visiting radio stations in Canada. So it gave me a chance to really thank Canada, you know, for what they had done up to that point. And, and I had some more top 10 singles there. And, so. you know, I'll, I'll reference this with a story. Um, when when your radio career comes to an end, it's a very bitter pill for a lot of people to swallow. It it's it's difficult hard. to adjust to it because there's a lot of uncertainty about what's the next chapter of my life. Where and am I going to go? And you're forty years old if, or something. And, you know, do I start right. over? I mean, can I can I continue to work the road and make a living of this? You know, and I I, I got to see a perspective from the the guys that, and the people that came before us. So if you think about you know when you came to town in the late eighties, about eighty nine when everything hit. When Garth and and Travis Tritt and Alan Jackson and Chestnut and Vince and all these guys, Clint Black, when everybody popped in '89, you could feel things changing. We roll into the new decade in the early '90s, and then all this stuff. Everybody starts changing to young country. The format's changing, and I remember doing shows with like Waylon and Merle, and they were angry at us. Mm -hmm. They blamed us because they weren't getting radio airplay anymore. Yeah. And the one artist that I, I got to work with Jones a lot in the early '90s, and Jones had a different perspective. He didn't take any of it real serious. He was glad to be having a resurgence of his own, and he had a whole nother career there with a bunch of hits. Yeah. And he, uh, he he really made me look at that and made me appreciate that we're all going to go through that, and you can either take it with grace or you can be pissed off about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And he really instilled that in me. Uh, but it's a very difficult thing, and I, I won't go down the list to mention names, but I've seen a lot of people uh, that were very successful with A-level acts that have had a real hard time getting off that treadmill, made some questionable Twitter posts and things years mm -hmm. ago. So, I mean, that's a really hard thing to go through. How did you adjust to it? It it took a while. I got I got 
I got bitter for a while and I didn't like the way it, I didn't like myself that way. So I started to really try and just adjust my thinking. And Trisha Yeron and I talked about this at one point. And she said, you know, when you really embrace being the elder stateswoman instead of fighting it, it, it becomes a whole other thing. And it's really pretty cool when you do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my tenure at, at country radio and, and getting airplay ended, you know, when I was 40, 38, 39, 40. So I was still relatively young. It was hard to embrace being an elder stateswoman at 40. Um, right around that time, my mom had been diagnosed with cancer and terminal cancer. So it was all a very dark time, you know, making that shift from being, getting off the major label and trying to it's acceptance of where you're at and, and, and not trying so hard to, to push a square peg into a round hole, so to speak. Um, I just, I, I just shifted, I had to shift my thinking, but it took a while. It took a long time. It took me years to get to the point where I didn't feel like, like if only I had done this different, if I only I had cut this song instead of that one, maybe I didn't look hard enough for songs. Maybe I didn't write enough. Maybe I was focused too much on this instead of that. You know, all of that second guessing everything you did that led to you not getting played on the radio anymore. Maybe it just wasn't supposed to be that way. And you got to get 10 years is huge. It's huge. And I had 10 years yeah. and, um, so I'm so I'm so grateful for it. And now I'm embracing, you know, just recognizing having some kind of a legacy to leave behind that is inspiring some of the younger artists is like, oh, my gosh, you you don't see that in your future when you're when you when you're looking out that windshield, you can't see that far ahead when all you're seeing is like the rain splattering on you and you're going, oh, God, it's over. It's over. And, oh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm still part of this and I feel so. I feel so dis disenfranchised from it. And for a while, I couldn't even watch CMA Awards. I was just, I couldn't watch it. I'm being really honest oh, with you absolutely. right now. Like, I, I don't, this and, is a vulnerable conversation, but. Well, it is. And, and, and I'm curious about it because I think we all go through it. And, and a follow up question with that How intertwined is Terry Clark the artist with Terry Clark the person? Mm -hmm. uh, because I have a hard time separating it. Going through COVID made me really wake up and evaluate, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, you have bad vocal night and you get depressed. You oh, know, if God, you go yeah. through a little period where things aren't going right, and you, you just kind of wallow around in it for a little bit because the two are intertwined so deeply that if I lose this, am I still going to be the same person? And I and I compare it to like when Brett Favre got run off from the Packers if, after he had been such an mm -hmm. instrumental part of that team's success and then th just feeling the disrespect and like you'd just been tossed aside. Yeah. It's such a really tough thing to experience. It is. And then, and then being at an industry event and people are coming up to you and going, so what you been doing when you've been on the road? Or reading on Facebook, yeah. people going, well, whatever happened to her? Did she is, did she quit? Did she re even now? Good, glad to see you're back out there. I'm like, I never, <laughs> I, I never I been, stopped touring. I've been on the road since night. When did your tour start? My tour started in 1995, and it's it's still going <laughs> it's on. Still going on. <laughs> it's not a tour. It's just constantly doing yeah. dates. You know, you're constantly out there. But those kind of things just under my skin. You know, questions like that when you're when you're out there, and just because people aren't paying attention to you anymore. Because you're not in the top ten anymore doesn't mean you're you're not working. They're just not paying attention, so they ask those questions. Well, and and it makes you realize that uh, people need uh, if you're going to remain on the forefront of their mind, you have to hit them with all this different stuff. You got yeah. to geo targets, you got to billboards, you got to do this, and you got to do this because you're going, you're competing with all yeah. this other stuff. You're competing with the the, the wrestling and the monster trucks and yeah. hockey and football and baseball and soccer and pop acts and rock acts and everything that's going on. I mean, if there's so much entertainment out there there's a that lot. to be for somebody to take their disposable income, which for some families is not a lot mm -hmm. and to spend it on you, you, you that's an honor it is an honor and it's I, a great I, I honor take i don't take it for granted yeah. i think i went through periods when i was younger that i did yeah i think we think we're invincible and it's going to last forever but yeah. i think the longer i go in this the more grateful i am for it all I, i'm 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 in awe more now than i was 10 or 20 years ago and i'm so grateful for it i don't there's not one little bit of jealousy or bitterness 
that I think we all go through in that transitional period between being yeah. the hot new thing and having radio success. And then uh, there's there's an in-between period, in between that and embracing where you are now. That That is a growing pain for sure. It's really tough. That's a tough transition to make. And I think everybody has to go through it. And hopefully that you come out the other side of it healthier and with a, a fresh, new, great, grateful perspective. Um, but to go back with, to what you had asked me about, how do I separate? If something weird happens, especially if it's beyond my control, the other night a thing happened at, at a TV taping where um, background singers were kicking off the song and I don't come in until the band actually, we all come in at the same time and they started in the wrong key. And it was in front of the entire industry. Garth Brooks was sitting down there. Awesome. Oh, yeah, right? <laughs> and I was so pissed off. Um, I recovered really fast. But this is just an example, and it's all fine now. But it was just an example of something that I carried home with me. But that's more on a professional level. Like, I want to do well. I put all this preparation time into something. I want, it, I want to do well. Uh, but... It didn't affect me like it would have at one time. It would have, it would have ruined my a month. It would have been a month of me just really just wallowing in that. But I know what you mean. Like we're all insecure at the core. There's a reason why we like to be adored and why we do this because it makes us feel good about ourselves. And we get that validation every <laughs> totally. weekend. Yeah. But but it's also been something that we've been passionate about since we were very young. Yeah. And and I feel like it's it it's so intertwined with the human being that I am that if I lost that, I don't know if I'd ever be the same. Hmm. I think, I think I would be okay. I, I think, I, you know, I, I, that's a very honest thing for you to say. Uh, I've thought about that a lot. If all of a sudden somebody said, you're done. Um, I, I think that I would, maybe I'm, maybe it's a, Maybe I'm, you know, n not going to know unless it actually happened. But I think I've I've dug deep about that and I think I would actually be OK and um, just find some other things to get passionate about. Like fishing. I love fishing. I could fish yeah. more, but <laughs> but. I think we I, would all be okay, but it there's would still, a separation it, it, it there. would be it would be a difficult adjustment because it's been so much a part of of who I am and, and yeah. my motivation and my drive and just overcoming adversity in life. And it's just, it would just be different. Yeah. It'd I think it's, I it, think individual basis, like what, I think everybody would be different in that situation. Some people might not handle themselves as well as they, they think they would. And some people would prob probably, maybe you'd do better than you think you would. Maybe I'd do worse. There's no way to know. Cause I don't think that's really going to happen to either one of us. I hope not. Luckily. But you, you know? would go through the grieving process and need to move on. That's yeah. what you'd have to do, but like, it would be a big adjustment. During COVID, did you ever have a fear? Like, is this, is this just going to last forever? Or are they still going to be there when I come back? Is the audience still? I had a lot of one, oh, a lot of uh, thought about that, wondering what it was going to be like on the backside of it. Would we ever get back to normal? Would things loosen back up again? Were they going to uh, start, you know, stopping buses all over the country and searching us everywhere we went when we crossed a state line? And I mean, I, you just didn't know what was coming. It was it was a very different time. I hope we never go through that again. I yeah, I, I hope not. I mean, I won't say it won't ever happen again in our lifetime. I don't yeah. know, though. But uh, yeah, it I found during that time. I settled into a, uh, this is all right <laughs> place. Oh yeah. This is all right. You know, and, uh, I, you know, th the list of what to watch on Netflix got smaller and smaller, but other than that, you know, <laughs> just, I never watched so much damn TV in my life, but I was cooking. I was, uh, spending time at the lake. I got really into fishing. I found a passion there during COVID that I really dialed down on and, and, learned how to tie knots and learned about different lures and and I, I just transferred my passion into something else that I'm also passionate about now and that's the gift I took out of that and um it's yeah it I like to think I'd be okay and I would adjust okay to it I don't want to be faced with that hopefully and that's why when we talk about retirement like as long as you're making you look down there at people singing every word to your songs and 
you know, I know you've got people coming to you going, God, I grew up on your music. And generations, I had three generations of women at my show on Saturday night, a grandmother, the mother, and the daughter. And I'm just like, wow, this is what it's all about. Like, yeah. you guys are bonding as a family over this music experience that I'm just a small part of, but what a cool thing to be a part of. And that music that you've made is a legacy that you're going to leave behind and hopefully it'll be yeah. around for a long, long time. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's a great thing to have something tangible, like being an author or a painter, or a musician, an artist, to have something tangible, a body of work that you're leaving behind long after you're gone. Yeah, and, and something you can be proud of leaving behind and something, and I know so many of these new young guys looked up to you. Like I know Aldine is like a huge fan of yours. Yeah. I like to give him a hard time. Uh, he had a poster of me up on the wall in his room when he was in high school. And I said, yeah, that's pretty cool. I had Farrah Fawcett. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when Cody Johnson told me he had a poster of me on his wall, I said, you can stop right there. <laughs> we don't need to hear the rest of the story. So uh, I, I, as we wind down, I, I know you've got an exciting thing coming up, and this will air after the fact. So mm -hmm. when you all hear this, she will have already played her first headlining show at the Ryman. Yeah, yeah. It's very I'm exciting very proud tomorrow for you. night. Oh well, yeah, it will have already aired. Yes, the the Ryman Auditorium is is having started at Tootsie's. You know, fifteen steps from the right Ryman. at the back door. Yeah. Right, fifteen steps and thirty seven years later, I'm getting to headline the Ryman. I used to. When they right before they did the renovation, when I played at Tootsie's in '87, I would on my breaks, you know, I'd do four sets solo there in the front window, and then I'd take a break and spend three dollars out of my tip jar to go and tour the Ryman just to stay inspired and and you know feel the energy in that room and and just let it kind of run all over me and walk across the stage. You got to walk across the stage and. There's um, something special about that room too. It's oh. like it's and I, I've seen comedy there. I've seen Three Doors Down there. I've seen a lot, obviously a lot of industry stuff there. But there's something about the way that the warmth of the wood in that room just embraces country music. Yes. You can feel it when you stand on the front of that stage. And it's one of the best sounding venues in the world. Yeah. Like your sound will be better in there than anywhere else. Are and you nervous? I'm not. I, I'm not as nervous as I am just excited. I'm yeah. really excited about it. Um, I, I can say this now. Trisha Yearwood and Ashley McBride are both going to get up and do do a couple of my hits with me. Awesome. Um, we hired a horn section. I'm going full on Toby Keith for Come this. Come on. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Because uh, we do we do everything in, in my show. We cover everything from uh, the New Radicals to Bruce Springsteen, Huey Lewis, Led Zeppelin, Kenny Loggins. Uh, we we cover a lot of ground, and then all my hits in '90s country, and some of the the new versions of these older songs that we've recorded. We're incorporating some of the newer versions on uh, of in the show. So um, even people who are walking in off the street and going, uh, "This '90s country thing isn't really my bag." Hopefully, they'll hear something that is. You know, it's it's a pretty rocking, high energy, in your face kind of show. It's not. I'm not. You know. Not yeah. just standing there like George Strait. No, there's a lot of sweat and electric <laughs> guitars. Well, George Strait, I, I'll trade places with George Strait. Well, I'll say that facetiously. I love George. Uh, yeah. Pull, find the, yeah. the pictures. Get all the pictures. If you get all those things up. I've got them keyed I, up. I want to tell you, I love you, and I treasure our friendship. We had a lot of great times back in the 90s. We shared the stage a whole lot. I have so many wonderful memories of all of our time together, and I really appreciate you coming and spending a little time with me. But the office dug up some old pictures of us. And oh my God! That, look at you! You just look like a brat in that picture. I was a brat. You just look like you're just ready to get into some shit. <laughs> Always. What's Always. the next one? I, I, I wish I could remember. Oh, where I love we were. that. Oh, me and you and Kenny. God, Bless. it's too bad he never made it. Oh, Bless his heart. He's still struggling so much. I think so he was much. so good. Bless his heart. Yeah. Like, why is where, my mouth That looks like open. an industry event. I wonder where that was. It looks like. Oh God! It does look like some and sort that of looks a bank. like probably ninety five, ninety six, yeah. somewhere yeah. around. Yeah, I still there. have that shirt. Do you really? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't Several. it weird to see all of the shirts from the nineties kind of coming? I'm seeing. I see people in the crowd with stuff that I wore in ninety four. And I don't know where they found it. Goodwill, you took oh, it all to Goodwill, Lord. and they picked it up at one of these vintage shops. <laughs> so sure. I had this, I had this uh, baby blue 
uh, Manuel jacket that was trimmed in beige, and I wore it with this orange brush popper, this hunting orange brush popper shirt that I had back then. Some guy brought it. He had bought it at an auction like three or four weeks ago and brought it backstage for me to sign. I hadn't seen this thing in years. I can't get an arm in it anymore. That is crazy. crazy. Oh, my gosh. All those crazy outfits. We'll oh, back to. What's, what's the next one? Uh, I haven't seen. What is with my overalls? Oh, geez. Damn. They were big in the 90s, too. Look at that. Look at you with your beers. Two fists. His shirt has watches. Oh, no, I, have I, have beer too. I don't know where that came from. Yeah, I'm we blind. Drank, we drank a lot of beer, didn't we? Wow. Look at that. That had to be one of the golf tournaments out there yeah. at the ACMs. That looks like a golf tournament after after a golf after tournament. After a golf shot. tournament. Oh, man. Look at how. What young happened to and... your hair? I don't know. I don't know what I was doing with that. <laughs> looks like God just took a wig and threw it at me. <laughs> here, here. So Come on. Got one hell? more. Yeah, there we go. Oh, City of Hope. The softball game. Is that Dina? I think that's Dina. Yeah, that looks like Dina. My eyes aren't really great, but it looks like Dina from here. I think that is. And she yeah. had overalls. Oh, on that's there. Dina. She yeah. barred your overalls. Yeah, she did. She took my outfit. <laughs> we used to just trade clothes around. Oh, look at that. Oh, my oh man. We had so Crazy. many great times. Oh, I know. We did. Do you do this with every guest? Do you no, pull I do not. Old, old no, photos? but I may need to start doing that. Well, didn't, I don't have old photos of all these young kids. Didn't I get drunk one night at an app? It was obviously after something and say to you, like, uh, hey, if we'd have gotten married, we'd have twice as much money. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think we were playing the Hollywood Bowl for KZLA. Is where that was. I think we were backstage the Hollywood Bowl in LA when I played the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, I have memories like that too. I think that's where it was. It was some industry event out on the West Coast. Okay, yeah, I got I got to play that that venue with Reba, but I didn't know I'd done it before then. I I think we had done it with KZLA, and they had a rotating stage. Oh man, you don't remember that? Mm Wow. It's all a blur. I have I have a lot of lost memories through that. I, old, I tell but I Lainey, drank every day. Back I tell then. Wait, <laughs> <laughs> I drank after every show. I tell Lanny Wilson to keep a ju- journal or something. I said, you know, it's all going to be a blur. You should be writing everything down. Like if I had anything to do over again, I would have kept a journal during all of that time to yeah. go back and look at. Yeah, I don't think so. There's probably it's probably best that I don't remember most of it. <laughs> 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 oh gosh it's been so great spending time with you i know you got a thank lot of stuff you. going on getting ready for your concert tomorrow i oh, love you excited. and i hope we get to do this again soon so uh maybe you start a podcast in your next venture well yeah. i might need to do that I've, yeah. I've wound up country gold i just recorded my last show yesterday so i don't know what's next on the horizon but my uh Hey, the world's our oyster, right? We can Absolutely. do if, if something great happened or came along. I definitely would be open to it. So the European tour, Y'all tour. European yeah. tour. That's European right. Tour. Go to Australia. Let's, let's make it happen. Do these I, albums. We should do that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Tracy. You're very it's welcome, so good to see you as always. And it's just the 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 longer life gets, the the more I I I just welcome seeing my old friends again and. It's God. We got to be around during a time that only we will understand. And I think so. we've all calmed down a whole lot. We're at a different stage of life, and I, I don't, I don't regret it. I'm, I'm in a good place, and you are Absolutely. too. Absolutely. I go to bed at nine thirty. <laughs> I go to bed. I go toward the bed before nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll end on yeah. that. Yeah. Aren't we exciting rock stars? <laughs> Terry Clark. Woo! Thank you. Thanks for having me.